Şimdi... Oh, my dreams have come true. I can't believe it. <gülüyor> Sally Gunnell, champion of the world. All her ambitions realized in this one race. It was one of the great races, one of the great occasions. She's the world record holder now, too. You are, in fact, the only woman to hold an Olympic, world, European, and Commonwealth title at the same time. Bearing that in mind, did you achieve everything that you wanted to? I can actually sit here now and say, yes, I did. I set my goals probably when I was sort of 20, 21, and those were the goals. And I think that was the hardest thing after achieving them. I then had it injuries, but yeah, keeping myself motivated. You know, setting new goals, right, I'm now going to be double Olympic champion, right, now I want to win the world championships again, I want to do this. And I did, I found it very hard to keep myself motivated because I'd set these goals for years and years and I'd actually gone out and achieved them. And um, the day that I announced that I was retiring, I was almost relieved, you know, and people said, well, you know, how can you do that? Surely there was other things that you wanted to achieve and it's like, no, you know, I'd achieved everything that I wanted to achieve on the track. I wanted to go out and do other things. You know, I had new goals that I wanted to do, and I wanted to forget the track. And uh, I was, I was, I was sort of like a whole weight off my shoulders, really, the day that I'd announced I retired. If 1992 was a dream year, 96 must have been a nightmare. Mm. Tell me about the Atlanta at Olympics. Well, my first injury I'd ever had, I was so lucky, up to 95, and um, I had a bone spur and had an operation at the end of 95. I uh, thought, right, problem sorted out, Olympic year, great. What, what is that? Uh, the a bone spur was in my ankle, mm. and it was literally, the bone had started coming away and was digging in, it was going to a point, and was digging into my Achilles and to my bursa, so I had to have it shaved down. And that is from years of training, from years mm. of pounding, putting mm. your body through 100%. You know, it, it's, a, it's a very fine line from getting injured and being 100% fit. And, you know, you're getting that line for many, many years. I was on that line. I was achieving what I wanted to do and just slightly pushed it too much because you're just slightly putting a bit too much training in. And that's when the injuries occurred. And 96, you know, I felt very much I was, I was January of, of that year. I was doing brilliantly. You know, I'd got back over the operation. I was back up there. Um, it's three weeks. No, actually, it was four weeks before the Olympic Games. I had my last race in Mazan. I was getting myself in, in pretty good shape. Yeah. You know, all the time with an injury, you're always playing a little bit of catch-up, but I felt I was getting there. And injured myself in my last Grand Prix race before the Olympics. And Gunnell beginning to pull back. Oh, she's missed her stride and stopped. She missed her stride completely and stopped altogether. And it was very much a case of, what do I do? Do I pull out of the Olympics now? Because you, you, know, you have to be mentally right and everything standing on that line for an Olympic Games. And I thought, no, you know, I've got nothing to lose here. I, I am already an Olympic mm. champion. Let's just get out there and see what happens. And I did some, fa some fantastic training before at um, Atlanta and felt as though I was getting back there. And it was niggles, but I felt as though I could cope with yeah. that. And the physios were brilliant and they got me there to the line. Got through the heat, it was a little bit sore, um, but actually got to the semi-finals and went over a hurdle and just literally landed very awkwardly, twisted it, and that's when the Achilles tore and it was halfway through the race. And there was just no way that I could carry on, you know, I tried to do one more hurdle and, and there was just no way. And I think it was painful, but I think it was just you know, you tried so hard in that last month to get back and I knew what it felt like to be an Olympic champion. I felt again that I was letting everybody down, you know, the whole of the nation is there. I'd, I'd heard from Barcelona where people were, the bars that they'd sat and watched me win Olympic gold and the stories and, and how happy they were, you know, mm. of going to bed that night. Well, never mind us, we'll recover. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I mean, it, it, it did break the nation's heart. Yeah. You know, everybody was behind you, but did it break your heart? It did, very much so, because I, because I felt as I was letting everybody down. And I hated being carried off the track. And it, I very much walked off thinking, right, this is it. You know, this is, this is the end of what I want to do, but this is not how I wanted to finish. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to retire then. You know, do I want to retire? I'm being carried off the track. And I actually went down to Angola with the Red Cross um, about six weeks later. 
and I saw all these people that had basically had their lives ruined, families that had lost people from the landmines, mm. families that had been, you know, people that had been maimed, and I thought, hang on, I haven't got a problem here. You know, what am I on about? I've got a bit of a poor leg, but I can get over this. And I decided there and then, right, I'm going to give it one more year. I made sure that I had things up and running. So for the following year, if I didn't make it, I had, you know, the gyms were up and running, and I had TV things and whatever. So I had something to go into, because that was the thing in '90s. I had nothing to do when I should have. You're a very sensible person. <laughs> Why are you a sensible Far too girl? sensible. <laughs> <laughs> Boring. But yeah, I think... I think with athletics, you've always got to be organised. You've always got to, to know what you're going to do. Yes, think and about when, for when, when it finishes, when yeah, it's over. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then the following year, um, going into the World Championships again, and I got a calf injury. And I was thinking, what is going on? I'm thinking, no, nope, this is it. I've had enough. The body is saying it's absolutely kaput. You can't carry on here. You put it nicely. And I thought, no, this is it. And I announced my retirement the next day. I had you know, many brilliant years and uh, I just felt very much as though someone up there was sort of saying that, uh, you know, you've had your luck, you know, it's time to move on and, uh, you know, I think in some ways it was probably an easy decision. I always hoped that I would know the moment to actually, you know, say that's it, call it a day. Now that was, your last meeting I think was at Gateshead, was it? Yeah, that I got injured in the August and I wanted to say farewell to everybody and do the Gateshead meeting and my injury wouldn't allow me to hurdle <coughs> and these guys said, look, we still want you to run, let's put on a relay and I hadn't done any training for about six weeks and, um, you know, and I sort of hobbled around with this fantastic race and to me it was the ideal way to go out because the rest of the team all put together this, this relay, 4x200 and we had, you know, the shot putters, the discus throwers, we had people from all over the world, the pole vaulters, and you know all my teammates mm. that have been there for years had, had all done this relay, and it was absolutely brilliant. Well, you, you had your place uh, in uh, sports history assured. You were you were a sporting great, but what did it feel like to, to say goodbye? It basically <laughs> say, well, 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 that's it, no more. Very sad, very sad indeed, because it had been my whole life. You know, I didn't know anything different, and I realise that now. I I, <coughs> I didn't realise how much I actually sacrificed yeah. my athletics in some in some way. And it was very weird running up that home straight, crossing the line, thinking, I'm never ever going to do this again. And uh, it was. It, it was very, very sad. But I could look back on it at, at being very fortunate, achieving my goals, being very lucky, meeting some fantastic people, having some fantastic times, and taking some really great memories away from me. And, uh, yeah, you know, there was a lot of tears that day, for sure. Now, looking back and amongst the memories, obviously to talk to you on this programme, uh, I had to look at a lot of footage um, of you running. Very impressive it was too. But as well as, as these incredible performances which stand out, there is something else. And that is the variation in <laughs> hairstyles <laughs> through the years. Was that <laughs> conscious or is that just, you know, did it just happen? Was it just the way you woke up one day or did you <laughs> did you sit down with a, with a top hairdresser and say, this is the look? No oh dear, I think... Um a lot of it was probably from mistakes that there was me in the bathroom trying to dye my hair a certain colour and going green and trying to rescue it. I don't know actually, I think since 92 I've sort of calmed down a little bit. I think a lot of it is that I get bored very easily and uh -huh. I think, no, I'm fed up with that hairstyle, let's try something new. But it's not the first time someone said this to me. At our wedding in 92, John's um, dad had done a whole collage of these photos going back from sort of 1982. And it's not until you see all these photos that you realise, I mean, there was short hair, there was blonde hair, there was dark hair, there was curly hair, straight, you name it. It was there, but uh, yeah, there's me. I've probably gone boring now. <laughs> is, is there a favourite for you or, or one that was a disaster that you looked and said, oh, no. The disaster was when I tried to dye my hair blonde and it did go green. <laughs> and ended yeah. up, literally, oh. and ended up having to go to um, hairdressers at lunchtime when I, was, when I was working in London and having it put right. So that was a disaster. But my husband likes it, he likes short hair on people and everybody else likes it long. So who do I please? Yeah. <laughs> you grow it long and tie it back the way exactly, you have yeah, yeah, exactly. today. <laughs> What's it like being a mum? Being like very different, but very rewarding and fantastic. Um, sort of fell pregnant almost straight away. I think it wasn't quite planned that way. We sort of wanted to have a year of travelling around and sort of enjoying life and setting up the gyms and things. But fell pregnant straight away. I think, you know, doing athletics for so many years, you never expected it to happen like that. But he's brilliant. He's sort of um, seven months now, 
and he's I don't know it's 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 very rewarding I, I never thought I'd find that I thought I, I'm, as I said I'm very one of these people that get very bored everyone said to me like, nine months of being pregnant you're never gonna wait that long you know <laughs> you're gonna be bored of sitting at home and uh -huh. uh, you know playing the mumsy bit and you'll be wanting to get out to work and but I don't know I, I do I love spending time with him and uh, yeah there's a lot going a lot on work ways but I just love getting home to him and uh, I just love the development side of it you know seeing uh -huh. him growing up so quickly and uh, it's lovely to be able to spend time time with him at home and being a normal sort of yeah. person really <laughs> and, uh, and i presume you named your little son after a doctor <laughs> finley <laughs> he's got, he's you know, finley. well everyone says where did you get finley from i was in charge of girls names john yeah. was in charge of boys names and he um boys names are very difficult and he came up with finley i'm not quite sure i like finn and i knew he was always going to be yeah. ch shortened and i did like finn and we used to listen to Finley Quayle, the singer. Uh -huh. and I think we sort of originally, you know, heard of the name first of all from there. But we just wanted something a bit different. So. Now, is is Finley preordained to go into athletes, bearing in mind the pedigree of his mum and dad? At the moment, he looks like a shot putter. He's a very big boy. <laughs> <laughs> he's got massive hands, big cheeks, and he's sitting there very fat. I don't know what a lot of pressure I have. I do yeah. feel a bit sorry for him in some respect. I'm pleased it's a boy because I think if it was a girl, there probably would have been more pressure on. I'm pleased he's called Finley Big and not Finley Gunnell, so uh, that may be take a bit of pressure off. But to me, who knows? I mean, I I, I will encourage him to do sport because I think it, it it's great for kids. It's it's good for their you know just their lifestyle mm. later on in life. I think it's a great development. Um, but who knows, I'll just encourage him. I won't be coaching him. I know John won't be coaching him. We'll just be on the sidelines encouraging whatever he wants mm -hmm. to do. Now, you and John, as I understand it, are involved in a different type of coaching um, nowadays and, and perhaps a return to your outdoor roots. Tell me about your, your future <laughs> sporting plans now. I suppose when you give up athletics, there's, a, there's all of a sudden there's a, a part of you that you know, it is missing to a certain degree. I'm still involved sort of seeing all the athletes and the TV side of it. But, you know, we had this area, all of a sudden John wanted to feel his dream of, you know, going out and getting that nervous feel again with sport. And he got into show jumping. So I went back to ride, and I used to ride when I was, was younger. And we've now got a half share in a horse who's uh, Kingsley, a youngster. And we're very much involved in sort of like the training side of it. Everyone yeah. laughs at this because I won't be riding him or anything like this because he's, he's, he's a mad horse. Um, but he's, you know, we're involved in sort of like the hurdling, the jumping side of it, which yeah. isn't a million miles away from the hurdling. And we go off and watch him jump. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, you actually this. advise the horse on how to jump then. It is. <laughs> well, no, everyone says this, but you actually, the drills that I used to do when I was hurdling yeah. are very similar to what he does. Going back to basics, and it's putting you know, jumps out, which are sort of like a, sh a few short strides away from each other, going back to the technique side of it, which he ever, never did. And, and it's, you know, Chris who rides and Chris Ellis sort of asks us lots of questions. We're doing sort of like the rest side of it. I mean, Kingsley never used to, to rest at all. And all of a sudden he's, he's, he's had sort of like a couple of months off and he's come out and he's jumping absolutely brilliantly. Isn't it amazing? And, you know, Isn't it's something different for us. We go off at weekends and I watch Kingsley jump and I watch John jump and uh, there you go. great fun. We're well, not watch you jump anymore, but isn't no. life strange? <laughs> it all comes full circle from, from you to your horses, jumping fences. Sally Gunnell, it's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Henry Cooper is Monday sporting great at the same time of 10 past 2 here on BBC2. And after the news, which is next this afternoon, catch up with Match of Their Day.